Hey there, my name is Adam from Powerbelt 3D. When I first started printing parts on a conveyor belt 3D printer, one of the things that I really struggled with and actually still struggle with from time to time is how to position them on the belt. Printing parts on a tilted axis conveyor belt 3D printer is different from printing on a more conventional 3D printer in a lot of different ways. So I already wrote an article on how to position and slice your parts for this type of machine. I'll make sure to link to it in the description, but I thought it would be interesting, fun, valuable, what have you, to actually go through a set of examples and just kind of talk through how I would orient them for printing. I picked a handful of models of different shapes, sizes, and the different features so that we'd have a nice variety. I'm going to run through them in no particular order. Uh, so let's get started. Before we look at any examples, I wanted to set the stage a bit. A lot of what I'm going to talk about has to do with overhangs. And overhangs work differently on conveyor belt 3D printers. On a traditional 3D printer, overhangs are generally acceptable up to 45 degrees of the nozzle in any direction. However, on a conveyor belt 3D printer, the angled nature of how the model is sliced changes where overhangs are acceptable. Just something to keep in mind as we look at these models. So we are going to start out by opening up IdeaMaker, and this is a profile that I have set up for the Powerbelt 3D Zero. Um, if you aren't familiar with this process, I did make another video on how to uh, get your Powerbelt Zero set up with IdeaMaker as your slicer. Um, I'll make sure to put a link in the description or a card on this video somewhere so that you can find it easily. Um, let's start with our first file. And the first one I want to look at is a print -a block. And a printed block is a plastic building block. Um, lots of people like printing Legos, but they just don't snap together as well as the real thing because 3D printer tolerances aren't the same as injection molding. So the 3D print professor uh, designed these ones, which are optimized for 3D printing. So I thought this would be a fun place to start. So let's just slice this model and look at it as it comes right into the software in the default orientation. So the first thing we want to do is move our slider, you can use the arrow keys also, and go all the way down to the first layer. So here we can take a look at our first layer, and this is already not off to the best start because we're actually starting our print on an overhang area, okay? And as we go up, the model builds, and this could work, but I think there are some better options here. So when you look at this model up close, you can see that it has chamfers on all of the sides. And on a traditional 3D printer, this is a good practice because it prevents any elephant's foot on the first layer from interfering with how the blocks snap together. But on a conveyor belt 3D printer, that means that we're going to have an overhang to start off our print instead of just a nice single extrusion. And you'll see what I mean when we look at some other models. Um, the other area that I want us to look at is if you look at, if we go back into our preview, we can look at this area right here. So on all the other connector inputs, connector sockets, maybe, um, they don't have any overhangs, right? Based on the overhang rules for conveyor belt printers, except for this part right here. So if we slide through these layers, you can see that, especially over here, this is just an extrusion segment in midair. This is also a very thin extrusion at a very steep overhang. And then we build up. So I would expect that this area would have some drooping plastic, which isn't typically what you're going for when you're printing a part. So 
what I think we should do for this part is actually rotate it 45 degrees along the z-axis. And let's re-slice it. Again, let's go all the way down to our very first layer. You can see that it's still an overhang based on that chamfer, but it's such a small amount of plastic that I don't imagine it's going to cause a lot of issues. Um, and then we can build up gradually into this triangle shape, which gives us a nice ratio of material on the conveyor belt versus the layer that we're building up. So then as we build up, you can see how the overhangs in this area, in this area, on what will be the sides of the cube, are relatively small compared to what we had last time. So this is probably the orientation that I would go for when trying to print this part. Our next model is similar. This is a wireframe cube. And if you were going to do this on a normal 3D printer, uh, it's probably doable, but you would need to use bridging to kind of print in midair along all of these sides on the top, or you would need to use support material from the bottom part of the model to these upper arms and then break away the material when you're done printing it. So let's go ahead and slice it and let's see what we got just in the default orientation. And again, first thing we want to do, go all the way down to the first layer. And this is a, an example of what I think of as a good first layer. It's a single extrusion of plastic going from left to right along the, x along the x axis of the printer. And then the model is built up from there. A couple interesting things happen as we work our way up this model. Right here. So when you look at this area on the leading face of the model, we are using bridging along the x-axis to start this upper arm of the wireframe cube. But we have only a single extrusion of plastic, and then we're trying to pile two or three extrusions on top of that single thin wire of plastic going from left to right. So I'd imagine we might see some drooping there also. But as we start the arms headed in this direction, of the cube, you can see that the angled slicing that we're using actually allows us to print in mid-air compared to having to use a bridging technique. And then as we meet the upper arms to the backside of the wireframe cube, again, we're using a bridging technique, stacking multiple extrusions on top of a single extrusion. And this is much different than how it would work on a normal 3D printer, so we might see some drooping on this arm also. I think what we can do is we can rotate this cube again 45 degrees to get a better result. So we'll slice it and look at the preview. Looking at our first layer, again, it's a nice single extrusion along the x-axis, and the model builds up from there. You'll notice that I chamfered the corners of this cube intentionally. That way we could have some extrusion along the x-axis to act as our first layer or our leading edge, as I like to call it, um, instead of having it just be a sharp corner. Um, if I had done that, it would be more difficult to get the print to start on the printer just because there isn't very much material. And as we start to look at the upper arms of the cube, again, we're able to avoid bridging and instead take advantage of the angled slicing and print in midair to form the arms of the cube. The next model I want to look at is an I-beam. So on this style of printer, it's a really popular kind of party trick to 3D print a really long object, whether that's an I-beam or a sword or something similar. How I like to print these is I have a small model uh, that is just the profile of what I want to make, and then we can scale it up um, as big as we want it to be. So, scale up to 500 millimeters in length, and then we can move it just so that it's back on 
our print bed. And let's slice it just to see what our toolpaths look like kind of by default by themselves. So again, the first thing that I like to look at is the first layer to see what that extrusion looks like. And because we are starting with a single flat edge, this is, this is looking good. This is a single line of plastic, and then we build up from there. The interesting part with this model starts to come into play with these arms at the top, specifically on the leading face of the model. We have these really thin features with, again, one extrusion width, multiple extrusion widths as they want to build on top of each other. And what will happen is if we don't have support material just at this very beginning area, you'll see some drooping on these arms. But once we've kind of established the feature itself, again, we can use the angled slicing technique and take advantage of it to be able to print in midair for the rest of the model. So there are a few different ways that we can apply support material just to this area. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into our settings. This is kind of a quick settings area that you can customize, but what I'm gonna do is I'm going to say generate all supports. Okay, and looking at our preview, we now have supports all along the entirety of this I-beam, which is really just gonna waste both print time and plastic since we only need it up at the front. So let's close our preview, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a modifier mesh to this model. So we can select our model, go to modifiers, and we will just insert a box. Then we can use this drop down menu to make this box into a support blocker for this model. Then I like to use the scaling tool to just manually adjust the size of this model. And then we can move it in position. And what is going to happen is everywhere where our support blocker modifier is coming into contact with our I-beam, it will block the supports in that area. So we can use this to block the supports in the majority of the model while still leaving a little bit just on the front of the model so that it can support those arms. So let's slice it and see what results we get. All right, so this is pretty much exactly what I was going for. We have support material in place where we need it at the start of the model, but the rest of the model doesn't have support material underneath the arms. It's just printing, again, using the, taking advantage of the angled slicing to be able to print in midair. So this is how I would choose to print this model. Next, we have a thumbs up model. Oh, and would you would you look at that? Oh, this is probably a, a great opportunity to uh, remind you to give this video a thumbs up if, uh, if you're enjoying it and if you find it useful. I'm going to scale this down a little bit. Uh, we won't need it at full scale to be able just to, to look at the toolpaths. There we go. And let's look at what the toolpaths look like uh, just in the default orientation that it comes in. Ah, and I forgot to turn off the support material, so I will go back and we won't need supports for this model, so we'll set it to none and hit slice and look at the toolpaths. Jump straight to the first layer, and it's very small. Ideally, we would have a longer single extrusion for our first layer. But 
probably not the end of the world because the base of the model does get wider pretty quickly. And as I'm scrolling up, this default orientation doesn't seem too bad to me. The reason is that this thumb, while it is a slight overhang, I would prefer it to be just straight up and down, um, it's not an extreme overhang for the printer in this direction. Um, so we could probably pull this off pretty easily, but we might be able to find a better orientation. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate this 90 degrees because if I look at because if I look at it from this side to me it looks like this is less severe of an overhang than what we see with the thumb itself so this would be a more severe overhang and let's start slicing it Again, let's jump to the first layer. Again, it's pretty small, but it is actually a little bit larger than in the last orientation, and it becomes wider very quickly. So that's a, that's a good sign. And as we go up, I'm zeroing in on this toolpath specifically um, and what this angle looks like to uh, just kind of judge how comfortable I am with this angle. And it is... Again, not straight up and down, which would be the ideal scenario, but it's not a super extreme overhang in this direction. Yeah, looking at this toolpath, I'm totally convinced that this is the orientation that I would want to print this model in. Next, let's look at Flexi Rex. This is a very fun model with a bunch of individual segments. Um, it's got some unique overhangs on the arms and the feet, and so it'll be a good model to try to look at. Um, again, let's just first start with just the default orientation that the model came into the program with. We can scroll through these layers, and you can see that our first layer, again, is very small. That's not ideal. Um, I would prefer to have a single larger extrusion that we can build off of. Okay, now here's where things on a belt printer get tricky. Essentially, we have a second first layer in this print. So instead of building upon the same plastic like you would in a traditional 3D printer, we are now applying plastic to the build tray or the conveyor belt in this case for the first time again in this print as we start to start our dino's teeth. And what you'll see is this happens over and over again in this model as you work on the different segments of the body. We're seeing it again happen right here as we start the second joint. This is a small piece of plastic. It's not connected to any other part of our print. It's just being deposited right on the conveyor belt. Again, you can see it happening in this area, and I'll just scroll through these, and you can see there's another one right here. And again, right here, plastic being deposited right onto the conveyor belt. And so these are areas that I like to try to minimize as much as possible, and when they happen, again, it's nice for it to be a longer extrusion across the build tray instead of just these small bits of plastic. You can probably make it work just in this orientation, but I wouldn't say that it's ideal. So let's move this 180 degrees and see if those tool paths look any more promising. All right, you probably know the drill at this point. I'm gonna go all the way to our first layer first. This doesn't look so bad. Here, again, we have, it's not a single extrusion, but it does have some space from left to right. It's not just like a single little dot of plastic, and then the model can be built up from there. Um, this orientation isn't bad. I'm focusing in on 
this small extrusion. So this is the first layer of this half of this joint in our dinosaur. Um, and that is a small, small amount of plastic. Um, again, it'll probably work. It's just not ideal. Um, if that little piece of plastic gets dislodged, then we could have a small bit of spaghetti in this part of our print disconnected from the rest of it. The other area that I find concerning is this overhang on the feet. So we're seeing uh, a vertical face, which is good, especially on the tail. No problems there, but this overhang might have some drooping. What I think is the best orientation for this little guy is if we rotate him around so that his nose becomes our first layer. And I think this for a few different reasons. The first is that we will have um, not just a point of plastic as our first layer, but we will have a short line as our first layer, and then we can build up from there. The other reason is that when I look at all of these links, each one of those will have uh, an equivalent of its own first layer, um, its first line of plastic being distributed on the conveyor belt. By positioning the part this way, each of those equivalent first layers, or I like to call them the leading edge of either the whole part or the leading edge of this segment, will be fairly horizontal uh, from left to right on the x-axis. So let's slice this and see what the tool paths look like. Again, let's look at our first layer first. And like I was saying, we have some extrusion moving from left to right. It's not just a single little blob of plastic. And, and as we move up through these, there are fewer small extrusions that have to come in direct contact with the conveyor belt. So. I would definitely choose this orientation for this part. Next we have an octopus model to look at and this one I think is interesting because it has these thin features. This would be really straightforward on a normal 3D printer because you would uh, put down your first layer and then build directly on top of it. It doesn't have any extreme overhangs um, but looking at the shape of the head this is an overhang area for an angled conveyor belt printer. So the first thing I would do is rotate it 180 degrees. And let's look at what those tool paths look like. Jump to the first layer. I'm going to look at the overhead view. Our first layer is small, but it does get wider pretty quickly and as we walk through these again we have an equivalent second first layer here where plastic is being put right on the conveyor belt in these two areas not connected to the previous layers of the print and so if those become dislodged in any way that can affect um, you know the end result of your print Here, as every one of these tentacles starts, we have that same situation. And so it's an area to be aware of when you are trying to position your parts. If I was super worried about this, I could always print it on a raft. That way, you would have the raft under the entire model um, to support it on top. And that raft would be a continuous small piece of plastic, which might allow for better part adhesion. Next, I picked this fun segmented lizard model, which is going to be uh, similar to the Flexirex that we looked at previously. So we will zoom in and look at our very first layer. It's okay. It's a, it's a small bit of plastic. I would prefer, again, a single extrusion along the x-axis from left to right. But when you're looking at organic models like that, it's a lot of times just not possible. Otherwise, this print looks okay. Here you can see that we have uh, some first layers going down for the little arms of our lizard. Uh, 
and we have some unique overhangs in this model. So right here as we're starting the second link of the lizard, this is going to be a fairly extreme overhang for an angled printer um, as it builds up this link within the lizard. And here we'll start to see as it comes together, this is again uh, a bridging moment just because of the angled slicing. I want to look at the right side of this model. So here you can see we have overhangs in this area. We also have overhangs in this area on the back of each link. But because of angled slicing, this isn't a true overhang, but these ones are fairly extreme. Ultimately, I would choose to print the model right in this orientation as it comes into Idea Maker. And the reason is this area of the model is going to be pretty visible when you are holding it in your hand. But these internal links are going to be less visible because they're on the inside of the model. And so if they're a little ugly because they are an overhang or if a little bit of plastic didn't stick perfectly to the conveyor belt, it's going to be a lot less noticeable than if um, we positioned it 180 degrees from there and these areas of the back of the links were uh, an area of severe overhang. Next, let's look at this dragon model by Luby. This is kind of a, a famous model within the 3D printing community. It's a little too tall, so I'm going to scale it down. But that shouldn't affect our ability to look at the tool paths. Now, on a normal printer, this model doesn't have any severe overhangs. It has an overhang for the head of the dragon, the tail of the dragon, and also the wings of the dragon. But none of them are particularly intense. They're all at, uh, I don't know, uh, less than 20 degrees side to side of straight up and down. But on a belt printer, because of the differences in overhangs, it's pretty much impossible to orient this in such a way that we don't have an overhang at the front of the printer, which makes it particularly challenging. And really, you just have to think about what features are most important to you when orienting this. So in this default orientation, chances are we might have some overhang droops on the tail, but more particularly along the wings. So the most intense overhangs are on the wings in these areas. Versus we have a shallower overhang on the head of the dragon. The other thing we have to think about is our first layer. And getting a good first layer with this wide part, the back of the tail, is probably going to be much easier than these teeny tiny points on the front legs of the dragon. So let's slice it and see what it looks like. We'll look at the first layer first. And while it's not perfect, it is at a small overhang. Um, it is a smaller bit of plastic. Um, and it does uh, go along the x-axis, so that's not terrible. Next, as we build up the model, we're going to be looking at two things. We're mostly going to be looking at the outline of our outside edge, but I just noticed as we're starting our feet, this is another one of those situations where you're putting plastic right under the conveyor belt partway through your print. And we're seeing some pretty steep overhangs on the back of the feet. That's a little bit concerning because they are just standalone bodies at this point. They're not connected to anything. Those steep overhangs might cause problems. But eventually, they do link up with the rest of the model. Whew, and looking at these wings, this is another steep overhang area. So this is an area that might actually need support material if you want the best possible surface finish. Um, but it is fairly thin also, so you might be able to uh, just use appropriate cooling and get decent surface finish on the bottom of these wings.
and the rest of the model is pretty straightforward. So the two areas I'm most worried about are the steep overhangs, starting the back legs, and the steep overhangs at the beginning of the wings. But after that, it, uh, it looks pretty good. This is one of those models where there is no perfect orientation, but this is probably the best that we can do. Um, one thing that I might do to try to keep these feet together as much as possible is go into Microsoft 3D Builder and add a small rectangle to the bottom of this model to connect the foot to the main part, and that can be trimmed away afterwards. That'll just give it a little bit more stability. That way, uh, the steep overhang doesn't knock the foot over, and then it doesn't actually get attached to the rest of the model. I will show you how to do that very quickly. It's super easy to do. Highly recommend uh, playing around with Microsoft 3D Builder if you've never done it before. Uh, so I brought in our dragon model, and then I can add a cube to our scene. I'm going to go back here and change its position to 0, 0. Truth be told, I don't use this program every single day, uh, so I'm not a professional. But everything is click and drag, pretty easy to use. Now we can select our cube. One thing that happens, you can see the blue outline on each model, is you have to click to select and also click to deselect. So right now, only our cube is selected, and that is what I want. I'm going to make this roughly one layer thick, so I will change that to 0.5 millimeters and then we can move it into position to support our back legs. We want to move its position to z equals zero. And I'm gonna want to scale this up a little bit more so that it can go left to right across the whole model. And I'm really only worried about the back legs. You can see on the front legs it has um, not as a pointy back to each of these feet. And so I imagine that those will uh, connect to the conveyor belt uh, more reliably and with less of a steep overhang. Not really worried about it. This looks good. So now I can save as and I can save out this model. You can choose a 3MF or an STL file. Um, Idea Maker takes both of them. So let's bring it back into Idea Maker and we can take one last look at the toolpaths with the uh, small brim that I added manually to this model. One thing that's interesting about 3MF files is you can select each body individually in Idea Maker. So here I'm selecting just the brim that I made, or I'm selecting just the dragon. And you can interact with both of them individually, which is kind of a neat feature. Um, but gets us in trouble in this case because the dragon scaled, but the brim that I added didn't. I could get around this by just exporting as an STL, and then both of them would be linked together. Um, and they would scale together within the program. I'm going to make sure that our Z thickness is 0.5 millimeters, or one extrusion width. And then let's reslice. Starting with our first layer, we can build up. And I am so much happier with this already. So we have some of those steep overhangs, but when we start those feet, they are already connected through that manual brim, as I've been calling it, from the very beginning. And I would imagine that that would drastically cut down on any risk of these small uh, ankles of the back leg of the dragon from falling over and causing more problems. So that would... Uh, so this is what I would consider the best case scenario for printing this model with no supports at least. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you found this video interesting or helpful in some way. Happy printing.